We are honored to have Dr. Jerry Collins provide the upcoming lecture. Dr. Collins is Associate Director of the Developmental Therapeutics Program in the Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnosis at the NCI. He received his PhD in 1976 from the University of Pennsylvania and completed a postdoctoral fellowship in clinical pharmacology at Johns Hopkins. He has authored or co-authored over 200 papers in the field of clinical pharmacology, primary emphasis in the area of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic principles in the field of cancer. Prior to his current position, he spent 17 years at the FDA. Please enjoy today's lecture. My name is Jerry Collins. Um, I'm here today to talk about uh, topics that are contained in chapters 32 and 33 of the uh, textbook. My day job is that I lead the Developmental Therapeutics Program at the National Cancer Institute. My background is that I've spent half of my adult life at the National Cancer Institute and half of my adult life at the Food and Drug Administration, uh, neither of whom assumes responsibility for anything that I might say tonight. Chapter 32 was um, written by Bob Dedrick, who originally uh, joined me in sharing this, but he's retired, left me his slides, and uh, I'll have to try to represent them as I can. Bob Dedrick uh, was a chemical engineer. He was a founding director of the chemical engineering section here at, uh, at NIH, and um, just had a marvelous perspective about the relationships between phenomena in the physical chemical world and phenomena in the biology world. So what do chemical engineers do? Well, one of the major things they do is they make enormous quantities of materials, specialty chemicals, bulk chemicals, kilograms in these large chemical plants. And how do they do that? Well, they start out figuring out how to synthesize the molecule in test tubes using milligram quantities. And so the process of going from milligrams to kilograms which is at least a million-fold difference, is what chemical engineers call scale-up. And as Bob thought about that process, his, his lifelong training, his question is, well, what's it like in biology? In biology, we have these, just within mammals, we have these tiny rodents, and we have these enormous animals. What are the similarities and differences? How do you get from small creatures to large creatures? What are the similarities? and what are the differences. In fact, one of Bob's favorite sayings is, engineers look for similarities, biologists look for differences. And most of the people who signed up for this course are, are of course, biologists, but um, we'll try to give Bob a chance to uh, uh, convince us of the role of um, similarities. So this is a lab tech uh, in building 37 and campus. Um, a little bit earlier in time when you didn't have to wear gloves all the time when you were handling animals. And so the mouse and the rat clearly have similarities. You can see that they look sort of the same shape and different from other mammals, but it's a tenfold difference. You're talking about a 20 gram mouse and a 250 gram rat. So what are the implications of that size other, other than uh, one needs more food to eat and uh, you know, more cage space. But Bob didn't stop it there. His other hobby was that he was a photographer. So <clears throat> sure enough, he wandered down to the Washington Zoo and took this picture. So the picture, he convinced the zookeeper, who was happy to participate in this experiment, to stand next to the elephants that the zookeeper uh, worked with. And so compared to a rat, a human is 300 times larger. But compared to a human, a mouse is several hundred times larger than a human, at least in terms of body weight. So we just have this enormous scale, just again, just within the mammalian kingdom in terms of um, what size processes were. Bob's a very curious person. He knew how that worked in uh, chemical engineering, and he wanted to learn and contribute to that in um, the world of drug distribution and pharmacokinetics. So it turns out that because there's such a wide uh, variation in body weight that biological processes have to scale. They, they do things differently, they do things at different rates, at different uh, turnover volumes, at the small end of the scale than the large end of the scale. And 
70 years ago, uh, Adolf uh, published this paper in Science, 1948, on allometry. And everybody's eyes glazed over and said, what, why do I need to know anything about allometry? Well, Adolf's simple point was, even if you don't know the fundamental underlying processes that you're measuring, whatever it is, uh, temperature, heart rate, heart rate um, amount of food intake, uh, body surface area, um, there's an empiric relationship that covers all of those diverse equations. And that's this equation in the middle of the slide where the property is equal to some constant times body weight to the nth power. Well, that's all that it means. It doesn't mean that we know exactly why A is one value and M is another value. It just means that as you, as you look at series of data across a wide range, this equation comes up over and over again. And for someone who's curious, they would say, this can't be a coincidence. In fact, this is very similar to the way chemical plants are designed. There's a scale up from milligrams to kilograms that follows a uh, allometric-like uh, like process. When you see these plots, they're a little different from most of the pharmacokinetic plots you've seen in this course in that it's a log-log plot. Both the y and the x-axis are logarithms. It's the only way you can squeeze all the data from um, a diverse mammalian species onto the same graph. And this, the two squiggly lines are just showing you what happens when the property is directly proportional to body weight, where the exponent is 1, versus when it's 0.7, which um, is sort of a magic number in allometry. And the good news is we won't talk about why it's a magic number. So here, here is uh, heat production. So all mammalian species are warm-blooded animals. They're aiming for a particular target body temperature. How do they achieve that? They achieve that primarily, except for us, they achieve it primarily by adjusting their rate of metabolism, adjusting their, their heat uh, output. And if you plot on the bottom everything from a mouse to an elephant over, you count them, half a dozen logs, and then you look at the uh, heat production on the y-axis, it, it keeps coming up again. No matter what property you are looking at, um, the allometric equation, the log-log plot is important. So this is the way Bob's thought process works. He says, well, there must be a lot of similarities. There must be a way we can put this together in a way that would be useful in drug distribution and pharmacokinetics. So more recently, a mere 40 years ago, Bob and his colleague, uh, collaborator, uh, Ken Bischoff, invented something called physiologic-based pharmacokinetics. Now, largely, Pharmacokinetics today remains uh, empiric based on one compartment and two compartment um, interpretations, but there are a number of questions that are much better answered or answered in more detail if you think about the underlying um, biology, the underlying physiology. So let's go through a couple of answers. One of the, one of the reasons I like Bob's um, publication on cytosine arabinoside, ARAC, is that he scaled the size of the boxes to represent the volumes of the compartments. In most of the empiric models that I see, all the boxes are the same size. That's OK. But it sort of gives you an idea of how important the muscle mass is. We rarely think about muscle mass in terms of the implications of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. But it's the largest reservoir, in many cases, of where the drug goes. Ah, the part you've been waiting for, a mass balance equation, particularly a uh, differential equation. All that's meant by a mass balance equation is take a look at an organ or an organism, figure out everything that goes in and comes out, think about what's happening in the end, and write it down, and see if you learn anything about the processes and about that uh, organ and about that organism. So what are those things? For metabolism, there are things like Vmax and Km. For transport, it starts with just blood flow bringing it around the body, various flow rates, Q. And then for other elimination processes, we talk a lot about clearance, Cl. Let's see what we learn from that. So this is one of the, this is, is the model that I've been talking about, Bob's model in, uh, for ARAC. And this is his simulation 
or ERA-C data at the bottom, the bottom line, and the sum of ERA-C plus ERA-U, its metabolite at the top, which is important because the assay a lot of people used in those days was total radioactivity, which was mostly measuring the metabolite. So do those lines fit those data points? I think everybody in this room could probably do a better job fitting those data points to a curvilinear line. But Bob didn't fit those. He predicted those uh, curves. Um, he simulated the behavior based on all those micro constants, Vmax, Km, blood flow, and total clearance. And in, taken in that context, it's pretty remarkable that you get anywhere near um, the uh, uh, empiric data on pharmacokinetics. That's one species, one drug. Does that generalize? Again, Bob's interested in principles that you know, go across a, a, a wide landscape. So this is another cancer drug, um, 5 fluorouracil And uh, over the years, data were collected in uh, dogs, humans, rat, and mouse. And they all look a bit different. Uh, when plotted, when co-plotted on the uh, same graph, where all you've done is normalize the uh, y-axis by, uh, by the dose. Um, wonder why that is. Wonder what the, what's happening there. Can the same structural pharmacokinetic model predict the behavior for four different species if you know the differences in the, in the micro-rate constants? And sure enough, you can do that. But a more important or more interesting question arose is, you know, it's not just size that changes across mammalian kingdom. It's also other properties like time. Heart rates uh, are radically different across uh, a species. Uh, lifespan is radically different. And it seems like each species has its own time clock. And can you correct for that in trying to understand differences across species? Well, um, Bob is far too humble to have called this a Dedrick plot, but uh, Core and colleagues published this in the late 90s, in which they named it after Bob, in which all they did was scale the time axis by body weight. And the concentrations all fall in, on the same line. Okay. In the grand scheme of things, what does that mean? Again, the fundamental message over and over again is you can find similarities even when there appears to be a lot of uh, differences. How hard is it to get those data to do those simulations? Well, um, in the metabolism lectures uh, in, back in the fall, you heard some talk about doing hepatocytes and microsomes and various ways of um, uh, looking at metabolism of drugs in the body. So this is a set of, I don't know, 25 drugs that was published by uh, Brian Houston in, um, in the earlier in the 90s, in which he looked at hepatocyte cultures. Okay, you, could, you can grow hepatocytes in culture, and this happens to be rat. So we're switching from human, which was ERA-C, to rat now, and instead of looking one drug, we're looking at 25 different drugs. And what Brian Houston and his colleagues did was create a physiological pharmacokinetic model which related in vitro benchtop measurements in hepatocyte systems to what that would look in the whole body of a rat. And then in their laboratory, they also collected the whole body data. Pretty remarkable curve. If you look at any of those points, there's deviations, but, and they're, sometimes they're the most important story. But the key is we're looking over three orders of magnitude, four orders of magnitude, and we're seeing similarities across a wide range, despite the fact that there are 25 radically different structures that are, are the drugs that were, uh, were studied here. Moving to human, uh, Ito and colleagues uh, a few years later did the same experiment that the Houston lab did, um, except they looked at humans. And they looked at a few more drugs than 25. I, didn't count them, but maybe there's 30 of these. Um, the interesting thing is that that straight line falls apart as you get very low. And as you get very high, it looks very similar. Why is that? Well, if you're interested in similarities, you focus on the right half. If you're interested in differences, you focus on the left. Both are important. If we go back to what, what was the fundamental rate of clearance in the rat, 
The curve ends at 0 0.1 um, in terms of clearance units on the y-axis, whereas in humans, it tails off at 0.1. What does that mean? There are other things in the body besides the liver that account for how a drug is biotransformed and excreted from, from, the, from the body. So in general, you would not expect metabolism by the liver alone to do it. It works in the rat because the rat is so incredibly efficient at transforming drugs relative to humans. So when humans um, have drugs that have low clearances, then you begin to see, to parse out this tail on the left side of the graph, which shows the non-hepatic effect. So again, you learn something from similarities, you learn something from differences. The last thing I, I wanna say, of course, I've already said that um, engineers look for similarities, biologists look for uh, differences, but both have in common the fact that they collect a lot of data in the laboratory and in other systems, and they want to use those data to predict or extrapolate or scale up from micro or mini systems to larger scale apparatus or larger scale animals. And so, always the engineer, Bob says, that biologists are, have a strong uh, interest in similarity, just like engineers do. All right, let's transition away. So, so in summary, Bob's idea and approach to this is to relate the things that he learned in the physical chemical world to things that are important in the biological world, particularly for, uh, for drug, de drug development. And that was very helpful in um, stimulating such areas as physiologic-based pharmacokinetics which um, took 30 years before, about 10 years ago, it started to go into the mainstream in, uh, in clinical pharmacokinetics. So some ideas take longer than others. What are we doing here at NIH? Well, on about that same time frame, about 10 years ago, NIH started to think about reinventing portions of it. And the NIH roadmap was one of the mechanisms for doing that. And one of the priorities in terms of um, rethinking some of the missions of, of NIH, was re-engineering the clinical research uh, enterprise. NIH is always and forever will be known for its basic research. That's, that's the strength. But since the basic research is supposed to lead to some payback later on in terms of the clinical domain, perhaps a little bit of thinking in that area is, is, would be useful. One of the things that came out of that process was the creation of a new institute or center the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, whose mission statement says they would like to speed the delivery of drugs, diagnostics, and devices to patients. It's not that the folks at NCATS or in Building One at NIH think that basic research is no longer important. It just means that we need to pay a little bit more attention and we need to have a critical mass in terms of uh, of the practical aspects of drugs, diagnostics, and, uh, and devices. Across the NIH uh, campus in various um, institutes, the institutes have had small therapeutics development or diagnostics development programs for a long time. Most of them don't have a critical mass, but they, they, they do perform a role within, uh, within those institutes. So it wasn't a completely out-of-the-box idea. It was just more like shining the spotlight on it. Now, in the program that I lead, uh, Developmental Therapeutics, uh, we do this with a, a much larger um, uh, mission. So let's do the math. 60 years ago, Congress passed a law that mandated NCI to figure out how to discover and develop new therapeutics for cancer. Uh, if you think the landscape is difficult for cancer therapeutics today, 60 years ago, it was even more miserable and Congress said, let's do something about it. There may be a parallel system going on in the current political climate, but we're government employees and don't talk about politics. In any event, our website, dtpcancer.gov, is the program that I lead, and our major pipeline is called next.cancer.gov. End of commercial. So chapter 33 is about first in human studies, which is an area that I've spent uh, most, of, most of my life, uh, most of my professional life working on. Uh, 
Uh, I am also, like Bob, a chemical engineer by training, but went into a postdoctoral fellowship in clinical pharmacology, showed up here at the NIH, and um, I, I spend just a lot of my time thinking about the interface between preclinical and non-clinical studies and uh, the early clinical studies. Statisticians, by and large, design pivotal phase three trials. They do a far better job than I ever would, but I'm interested in that interface between the last of the preclinical studies and um, the early clinical studies. So over the last two weeks, Ed Sauceville and Chris Takimoto have been trying to line you up to think about the transition between the late stages, the transition between the late stages of preclinical development and how that influences the earliest, uh, earliest clinical phases. And you can find in any textbook or review article a diagram like this and it is a nice model system to think about, but it certainly doesn't reflect the way all trials are done. Increasingly today, folks will say, I've seen some really exciting results in a tiny number of patients in first in human phase one studies. I'm gonna make a large gamble and go to an incredibly expensive, large, complicated phase three study. That's a big gamble. The success rate is relatively low. But when it turns out you gain years, almost a decade in some cases, um, and you advance an effective therapy into the clinic. But it's a big gamble when you go outside this uh, paradigm. Similarly, drug gets, does okay in phase one from a safety perspective, gets to phase two, and it looks like it has this little problem that it, it doesn't have much activity. And so there's a panic and you certainly don't want to go directly to phase three just because you finished your phase two if the result of your phase two is you didn't find much activity. So you throw it back to the lab and you say, fix this. Get me a similar molecule that actually has act activity. So this is the real world. There's a lot of back and forth, a lot of iterative processes till you get to the clinic. Uh, this slide just talks about the contemporary trend to re-engineering. First in human studies, there's a lot of new players. Cancer is a more attractive uh, target for many drug development sponsors, commercial and non-commercial, and just many things are coming together to challenge the traditional way that we've developed drugs. Are there some better ways? Well, I, I can't count the number of different ways that you can do a first in human study. There are many of them, and my advice is not to get too attached to any of them. This is an era in which there's enormous flux in the philosophical underpinnings of what a first in human study is, is all about. And there are radical changes that occur all the time. I would encourage you to think about the fundamental principles that no matter what algorithm you use for conducting a first in human study, you have to do the scariest thing in drug development. You have to pick the size of the first dose in the first human being. Okay. So all the modeling, all the preclinical studies, all the genomics in the world don't, you know, help, help reassure you that you have the right starting dose, but you generally use a pretty large safety factor. You, th you calculate what you think the right dose will be in humans, and you put in a safety factor, and you hope everything goes well. If everything goes well, your reward is you have a second problem. Where do you go from the first dose? The first dose is rarely ever the right dose. The right dose in either one that does, it is basically the therapeutic index. It either doesn't have enough activity or it has too much toxicity. So you're gonna to have to go somewhere up or down. Usually because you've had a large safety factor, you're going to have to escalate. That is almost as scary as picking the first dose. Why is that? Because if you escalate too quickly and you have a steep slope a narrow therapeutic index, you can go from a dose that's pretty well tolerated to one that's life-threatening. Uh, uh, pretty scary. I mean, underneath everything, we first do no harm, but it's a tough balance between doing no harm and being timid. What's the downside of being timid? Well, if you're an investigator, if you're a patient, the downside is you'll get homeopathic doses you'll get doses that have no chance of improving your treatment at all. 
So in order to maximize the potential benefit to patients, you have to think of ways of doing escalations that we never considered before, like escalating within the same patient, like taking larger steps. Um, if you're an investigator, at the time that I first came into this field, there had just been a series of first in human studies at large cancer centers that took three years to complete. So from the time the first dose was safely given until the time that the final dose which is just the beginning of the process of figuring out whether there's any activity was defined. That creates a terrible discontinuity between among the clinical studies, clinical fellows who are designing the study, the clinical fellows who are running the study, and the clinical fellows who are interpreting it and trying to write it up afterwards. So it, it's efficiency is not just a fancy word. Efficiency is very important for patients to get uh, potentially exciting therapy for investigators to, uh, to move along with their career and to keep the whole thing uh, going. The conflict is between caution, safety, efficiency, and efficacy. No matter what design you choose to use, you're still gonna have to face that, uh, that factor. For um, 50 years, there was something called the modified Fibonacci escalation scheme. What that meant was that when you submitted a protocol to your IRB, your ethics committee, the escalation procedure was predefined and that you would follow this mathematical algorithm for, for increasing the doses. So your safety factor, if you look at the uh, low end of the scale, 0 0.1, if you have a 10% safety factor, then your starting dose is 0 0.1. And if that's safe, where do you go next? Well, in general, in balancing safety versus a desire to get some efficacy, you assume I had such a big safety factor, I want something big for my first step, so you double it, all right? And everything is still okay, that's the usual outcome. But you're nervous about continuing the doubling because you don't know what you don't know. You don't know where you are in humans. Nobody else has been there before. And so this idea that you would um, serially reduce the incremental step in terms of percent escalation, uh, very roughly tied to the uh, Fibonacci series in mathematics, became the gold standard for how um, first in human studies were done. Again, many inefficient studies because you reach, you cone down to such a small step that you're, 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 you're working hard against intersubject variability. If you have a dose escalation step of 30% and intersubject variability of 40%, um, you have to be careful about the noise. So a number of adaptive uh, designs have been proposed, uh, not just by uh, myself and my colleagues, uh, Bob Dedrick, uh, Bruce Chabner et al., but by others in which they try to think of ways of fine-tuning the escalation scheme so that it's no longer predefined. So you tell the IRB what your starting dose is and you tell them how you will make your adjustments, but you don't lock it down in concrete. So let's talk about what those principles might be. Well, this is a PKPD course. So our fundamental thought is that concentration circulating in the body tells you at least a lot, not everything, but tells you a lot about what's uh, likely to happen in terms of toxicity and efficacy. Indeed, the concentration of drug circulating in the body is considered a biomarker or an endpoint in many clinical studies. We expect in the toxicity domain equal toxicity for equal exposure. First in human is all about hoping you have a terrifically effective drug but the first principle is, is it safe? Can this structure be given safely to human beings? So how might you do an adaptive design? Well, pay attention to what you already know. So if you um, give the biggest dose you think you can to humans, you compare it to, to start with, you compare it to how large a dose animals tolerated. All right, so that's just on the basis of dose. And you know, that's one way to escalate.
But when you consider interspecies differences in metabolism, uh, you're probably much more interested in blood levels or concentrations in plasma because that's what pharmacodynamic effects are, are built upon. So you can change your escalation strategy to a, from a predefined set of numbers on a universal scale to a strategy that says the size of my escalation steps will be determined by whether it appears that we're very far away from the target or we're very close and we need to be cautious. Well, you don't just say, that's a good idea, let's go out and do it. You have to generate a database, you have to evaluate it um, uh, retrospectively before you can jump in. So uh, my colleagues and I did a study of um, anti-cancer drugs in, in humans in our program at NCI versus um, the toxicity and pharmacokinetics that were done in mouse, which are primary efficacy and, and sort of an early toxicity ratio. And the histogram on the left shows that there's a lot of variability. What have we done? We're just looking at the ratio of dose that causes toxicity in a human to a mouse. And the good news is the biggest bar in that bar chart is clustered around one. That says that dose is not a terrible predictor of toxicity. The dose that's tolerated in rodents may actually predict the dose that will ultimately be tolerated in humans. However, it's far less than half of the time, so we still need something else. So when we looked instead, again, this is retrospectively, because you don't do a study like this uh, prospectively uh, uh, without a, a serious database, we looked at those same set of drugs in which we looked at the area under the curve or the total exposure um, in humans compared to mice, and what did we find? We found that that curve clustered around one swallowed up some of the two tails of the curve. So area under the curve did a better job at predicting toxicity, relative toxicity across species than just looking at those ratios. The left-hand side of that histogram um, tells you the danger zone where for some reason humans are hypersensitive relative to the non-human species that it was tested in. And so at, a, at, a, at the same relative concentration, humans will have more toxicity. You can't completely eliminate that. You just have to narrow down the number of cases that occurs. On the other hand, to the right of the tail are the cases of where humans can tolerate the maximum concentrations in rodents without any trouble at all, and you can escalate four or more times fold. That is a serious efficiency problem. It's less of a safety problem, but um, it's the real world. So that's one, one type of design. It's a hypothesis that we could improve the way first in human studies are done by taking advantage of a well-established clinical pharmacology principle that it's the concentration that counts. The dose is just a way of getting the, delivering the concentration to the uh, individual individual preclinical species are clinical. For those cases where there are discrepancies, and, and so we're, we're sort of satisfied with the results there, but, but we're curious too, and we want to know why there's a, a big difference. So earlier in this course, Sandy Markey uh, taught a couple of courses on how to measure drugs and how to interpret structures. And um, one of the things that he didn't spend as much time on was species differences in drug metabolism. He told you the tools of how to develop that. But um, earlier in his career, he spent a substantial time investigating differences uh, in, you know, just take half-life as a parameter. So phenylbutazone, a drug that's no longer in the market, uh, for humans anyway, um, has a three-hour half-life in rabbits, uh, six hours across a wide range of species, uh, rat to dog, and then in humans, and this is part of the reason why it's no longer in the market for humans, is a three-day half-life in humans. So the experience that you gain looking at a rabbit, a rat, guinea pig, or a dog don't adequately prepare you for this, this large difference that's seen in, uh, in humans. We know a lot, uh, pharmacogenetics tells us a lot about the enzymes that uh, do the metabolism, about species differences, species variation in those. We can do better in predicting it, but it's always lurking in, in the background. So in my mind, metabolism is the 
principal confounding factor, confounding factor in first in human studies. Um, Pacotaxel is a very successful anti-cancer drug. At the time that it was uh, being developed, all of these principles about interspecies differences in metabolism, this would be the early 90s now, were just uh, beginning to sink in and have an impact on the drug development process. And it was a little bit embarrassing that we were about to put paclitaxel into patients without knowing this. Are there any major uh, landmines in terms of its drug metabolism? So uh, the folks in my lab uh, compared um, microsomal metabolism of inhuman and rat um, microsomes and looked at what happened. Fascinating. The uh, humans make a very unique uh, metabolite, which the arrow at the top identifies as H for 6-alpha hydroxypacotaxel. Rats make none of it, and rats were the primary toxicology species for this. Uh, rats make the biggest thing they make is peak A followed by peak B, and humans make it not at all. What does that mean? Well, you don't throw out everything, but it makes you think a little bit more carefully about how to interpret your toxicology studies. Good news is A, B, and H all together have minor biological activity for either toxicity or activity. Not so much a problem. They do influence the um, amount of parent that's circulating because the faster it's metabolized, the lower its value is. But it turns out that if you just follow the parent concentration, you'll, you'll be in good shape because that's where the activity and the toxicity is. Um, an important lesson, important lesson to learn, um, frequently cited in the uh, drug-drug interaction area. But here's a more famous one in the drug interactions, and, and I know you've been very patient in sitting through a bunch of oncology examples, but let's go to allergic rhinitis. This is runny nose season right now, and most of you don't realize that the original way antihistamines worked were by making you drowsy and you didn't notice your symptoms. Right? That doesn't do anything for your productivity, so the pharmaceutical industry developed what they wanted to call non-sedating antihistamines, and my former employer, the FDA, said, why don't we just call it relatively non-sedating and we'll all be happy. So that's, that's what those commercials that scroll by on the television are. The most successful of the early class was uh, terfenidine, which was marketed as Seldane. It was a prescription drug in the U.S. It was over-the-counter around the world, and there was a pending application at FDA for it to become over-the-counter. All of a sudden, at the emergency room on the other side of Rockville Pike, in what used to be called the Naval Hospital, there were a series of patients who showed up in their late 20s, early 30s, who had bizarre heart rhythms toward side the point. And they didn't have any history of heart problems. They um, had been taking antihistamines for a while. They were taking terfenidine, and it was just really confusing to figure out what happened. Well, what happened is they got a concomitant infection of some sort, and they started taking um, other medications, um, such as ketoconazole or erythromycin, that interfered with the metabolism of terfenidine. And it turns out that when terfenidine, 60 milligrams, is swallowed, what you see circulating in your body is no terfenidine at all, zero. It's all the primary metabolite, fexofenidine, which today, of course, is marketed as uh, Allegra or the generic form. Well, who cares about all that stuff? Well, we do, because there's a one-to-one -one correspondent relationship between the, amount, the concentration of terfenidine or fexofenidine that has the desirable effect and a 10,000-fold difference in the toxicity in terms of cardiac ion channels. Remarkable. It was not important as long as every molecule of terfenidine that was swallowed got metabolized in the GI tract and the liver before it circulated to the heart. But as soon as you block that process with another drug, then you could suddenly measure terfenidine circulating in the body, and that could be related to the heart defect problems. So this was the wake-up call or drug-drug interactions. That's the reason we have to read all these complicated labels. 
and all these potential drug interactions that occur because you, you got to sort them out, you got to prioritize them, but you can't overlook them, particularly in patients who take a half a dozen drugs. All right, let's try one more approach, pharmacodynamic approach. So I really like pharmacokinetics, helped my career a lot, but it's pharmacodynamics that what we're really interested in. Does the drug work? Is it good? Does it have too many side effects? It's all pharmacodynamics. And so could we design first in human trials based on pharmacodynamics instead of pharmacokinetics? Doesn't seem um, like there's any reason not to. So you have some kind of reference dose in the animals, typically a, a maximum tolerated dose, so it might be just a, uh, a minimum effective dose. You attach some safety factor between 10 and 50, and that's your starting dose. And then you have a whole rich body of of data from your preclinical studies that define the target pharmacodynamically for it. If you're trying to inhibit an enzyme, what's the inhibition of the enzyme? If you're trying to tie up a receptor and block it, what percent blockade do you need? You have a very rich set of in vitro and in vivo study in the preclinical domain. Why not use that as a reference for assessing target impact in humans? And could you make decisions on how large an escalation or whether to even stop the trial because of futility? You're already well past your target and you're not getting any benefit. Humans must be different. There are some studies like this that are done. They're more challenging. But I think the most important thing, as I said at the beginning, don't get attached to any particular design. Get attached to the questions that you want to ask. Get attached to what you want to learn from doing these studies. So as, as I was leaving my former employer to come back here to uh, NCI, we were trying to, internally, we were, the FDA was a little bit out of the box, trying to generate more innovative designs in first in human studies and trying to enable academic, nonprofit government investigators to do more limited studies that would help them take their laboratory-based studies to the next step. And so we put out a, a document called Exploratory INDs, which essentially permitted limited human investigation with a more limited preclinical package. Um, you're exposing fewer subjects. You're doing that in centers that are uh, incredibly uh, talented in this area and do intensive monitoring. Essentially, we were trying to encourage molecular proof of concept, just what I was saying before. Is the enzyme inhibited? Is the receptor blocked? And we were also trying to encourage functional imaging, which had been sort of caught in, in a difficult space in the regulatory world and needed to be well-defined in terms of that can be a generator of biomarkers and can be helpful as an exploratory sense as well. At NCI, um, my soon-to-be colleagues were working on something called phase zero, which was very much the same thing as let's upfront limit how far we're going to go into the clinic in return for uh, getting there faster. So as, as we saw earlier in this talk, uh, the historical phases of human evaluation, phase one is about safety, 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 and it would be nice if you could learn something about activity. You should certainly look. You're likely to find some surprises. Phase two is where you're, you're, you're really making your business model. Is the activity promising or is it not? Can I invest in this compound or is a 5% response rate too low? Or is it too toxic? And then phase three is, is comparative, is does this compound, does this drug development program have anything to offer that's an improvement over current therapy? Phase zero is stepping back from that. It doesn't exist as a real entity, it exists as a concept. There are phase zero studies done, I'll show you one of them, but it's really about what is the most important thing about this compound that you want to learn as soon as possible? Everybody would say, does it work? Well, yeah, but you gotta back off from that. You've spent millions of dollars figuring out why it works, selecting the thing that has the best impact on a particular uh, mechanistic uh, target, you want to know whether you actually get the desired effect. 
You don't get that by just measuring whatever the dose limiting toxicity is or counting the number of responses and dividing the number of patients that are on. Those are incredibly important endpoints in the trial, but they come later, and to get higher doses require um, more safety study preclinically. But you could learn a lot about mechanism of action. You could answer important questions if you had a process like an exploratory IND or a phase zero. I can't tell you how hard it is to get people to articulate the question they want the answer to. I would have thought everybody can, knows what they want. They want to go to the next stage, is essentially what you know, I usually hear. What is the key piece of information? Some of the, sometimes it's a very limited question that builds on experience with analogs that had problem getting in the body or problem with toxicity or something like that. But when you really have a novel chemotype, what, is the, what, what, what do you really want to do, and how are you going to figure that out? So almost all drugs are given orally, and they don't work systemically unless they get absorbed. And they don't always get absorbed. Uh, a fair number of drugs are chemically unstable at pH 3 in your GI tract or even unstable if you take proton pump inhibitors and have pH 6. Um, there's also a lot of enzymes that line your gastrointestinal tract, and every molecule essentially has to go through the liver before it goes to the systemic circulation. And then there's those formulation things. You swallow a nice hard pill, and it comes out the other end as a nice hard pill. You know, that, that actually does happen. So a key question is, this is my drug. This is the thing that I think has the best chance of working. Can I achieve adequate concentration? So that's simple. That's not very complicated. Why not do that in your first set of patients? Um, in a project we did in this uh, building um, in, on the NCI clinical service, we were looking at an enzyme inhibitor, and we wanted to know whether this DNA repair enzyme was inhibited. We couldn't tell that from looking at bioavailability studies by looking at whether, whether it was absorbed. We could only look at it by measuring the products of the enzyme reaction. All right. Did we do it or not? We're not interested in what's circulating in the plasma. This is pretty tough. We're interested in what happens selectively in the tumor, and so we have to look in the tumor. Pharmacokinetics is hard enough when you collect uh, plasma and urine and stool and occasional opportunistic samples somewhere else, but to design a study that requires a tumor biopsy, it, it requires really good hypothesis and a strong motivated uh, uh, patient population, and don't do it without an incredibly well-documented assay. You, know, you don't develop your assay in tumor biopsies. You have your assay ready before you get there. So what happened upstairs on the 13th floor? So Viliparib was a PARP inhibitor that we partnered with uh, Abbott Pharmaceuticals on. We did the first in human study here. It was a phase zero. It was only intended to be a single dose. A single dose is not going to be therapeutically effective because you need to inhibit the DNA repair for some period of time. It's unlikely to be toxic as well, so the FDA was fine with us uh, choosing this mechanism of action to go. So we started at a single doses of 10 milligrams and went up to 50 milligrams. And by 50 milligrams, we had reached the target. What was the target? Other than wanting to make sure that it got in the body at all, we looked at the concentrations that were circulating in the preclinical studies that, of tumor-bearing animals in which there was a target effect. So essentially, we were saying, as you've learned in many lectures in this course, that the concentrations circulating in plasma can give you some information about what target you're looking for. This is not the final answer, but if you can't do that, then the rest of the, the, rest of the process is going to be more challenging. So we met the first goal. What about the second goal? And that's, can we get definitive results out of the tumor, tumor sample? And so here's a series of a half dozen patients that were, were studied again here in this, in this building um, in, the first, in the phase zero study. 
And for five out of six, at, a, at dose that achieved adequate concentrations based on preclinical studies, for five out of six, pretty much depleted entirely the product of the enzyme. So we had a dose that looked good based on preclinical studies and based on actual studies in tumors, looks like it intended its goal. We had one tumor that barely responded. That just shows we didn't make up the data because that's the way real, real data actually works. Are we finished? Should we invest a billion dollars in this drug? Not now. There's still a lot to be done. It could be that there's a disconnect between the mechanism of action and the actual clinical anti-tumor activity. A lot of work to go. But you're willing to make larger investments when you have these kinds of data. So we did a variety of studies by looking at different doses and different time intervals between uh, the dosing to help us define how to do what essentially was almost going directly to phase two because we were, we were ready. We've had proof of concept. We were ready to see, uh, see what could be done. We needed to know a little bit about dose ranging and um, uh, dose intervals. Let me say something about uh, functional imaging, which was the other part of this guidance. Um, Bob Innes gave a talk. He was like the third one in the in the series uh, in the fall, and he covered this from the standpoint of PET as a tool more to learn something, uh, in particular about the brain, and um, very very uh, attractive uh, tool. We're greatly indebted to the neuroscientists for here at NIH and elsewhere for developing it. But in terms of new agent development, let's think about the questions again. I want to know if the treatment impacts the desired target. If it doesn't block the receptor, I'm not going anywhere else. Okay, so somebody appointed me the manager of a billion dollar company to figure out what things to go. I'm not going to go further if it doesn't impact the target. It's too early. And everything I invest after that's going to be very high. I do want to know what the minimum dose it causes an effect, and I want to know what the maximum dose beyond which you no longer get any effect. The shape of the dose response curve. And my marketing department has said that this pill can only be given once a day because that's what patients like. But I need to know scientifically whether once a day is the right dose interval or not. And it's very clumsy to do this in just empiric studies of toxicity and activity. Can be done, has been done, is done. But maybe if we had biomarker-driven um, answers to these questions, and maybe if we used the PET technology, we could find some ways of doing this with just a handful of subjects. So this is a different version of the slide that Bob Inna showed in his talk back in the fall which I'm going to use to address these three questions. So the first question is, so that I can tell that nasty manager who's analyzing the pi managing the pipeline, this is uh, an enzyme um, monoamine oxidase type B. It's a um, reversible inhibitor lozabamide, investigational. Did it do anything to monoamine oxidase type B? And you don't have to go to medical school or nuclear medicine school to say, that at 25 milligrams twice a day in the upper right-hand corner, there is far more bright spots than there were at the baseline scan in the upper left corner. Furthermore, so yes, the answer to the first question is yes. The second question, those minimum maximum doses are what's the shape of the dose response curve? And that's the lower left-hand current. When I double the dose, the few remaining flickers of candles that are left in the brain uh, disappear. I've got complete inhibition. I'm wasting my time going any higher, assuming this is the mechanism. The third one is the challenge is, can I give this drug once a day, or is it going to take more often? It was given uh, twice a day in the, um, in the investigational study because the, the established marketed agent, uh, Depronil, um, is, um, is given twice a day. So they thought they would use that schedule. The PET image was taken 36 hours later. What does that say? That picture is um, not quite as bright as in the upper left, but it's pretty much there. It looks like 36 hours, would, would, in addition to being impractical, would be terrible. It doesn't tell me whether I need to get, I know that every 12 hours works because we gave it BID and we looked at the end, okay? So 
Somewhere between 12 works and 36 hours doesn't is the answer to whether I can give it once a day. These day, this, this design, this experiment didn't answer that question, but if we had had a 24 hour experiment, it would have. Um, fascinating approach, it only takes a handful of subjects to figure out um, uh, whether, whether you've achieved your molecular goal or not. Does this say whether lozabamide is gonna be a blockbuster drug or not? No. According to published results, lozabamide was pulled from clinical development because of hepatotoxicity. All the brain scans in the world, folks, aren't going to tell you anything about hepatotoxicity. And um, you can minimize your risk, but you're always looking. So to sort of get up to the, the wrap-up uh, portion, um, when I first started giving these talks, um, Many people were concerned that first in human trials were changing right before their eyes, that there were different questions that were being asked. Everybody was under great pressure to do them faster. There are all these laboratory-based correlative studies, whereas previously phase one studies have been very simple. Well, now first in human trials aren't necessarily phase one. They're also phase zero. And I think that the community who does these studies is now comfortable with that. So yes, there's an identity crisis if you think that your design will work the same for every drug that comes off your assembly line. But the most important thing is you've been challenged to figure out what design you really need for your drug. So maybe it's an identity crisis, but it's good. The other thing, and, and really the last take home message is that that is invariant, regardless of what design you use, is no matter what design you use, what's going to be inherent in first in human studies. If it's never been in humans before, there's a good probability that you're gonna see something different in humans that you weren't prepared for in all the non-clinical studies that you do. Sometimes it's actually a pleasant surprise. Sometimes it's annoyance, it's a, it's a scale. You know, one end is pleasant, in the middle is an annoyance, and on the far side is it's a deal breaker. Um, a side effect that wasn't predicted by animals, a uh, molecular biotransformation that wasn't um, anticipated, parallel pathways that overcome the intended mechanism of action. Um, is this an excuse not to do the best design you can? but it's a cautionary tale that you always keep looking. And clinical pharmacologists by nature are often the first time that first people who, regardless of the discipline, who ask questions like, well, what happened to the hearing? What happened to the hearing? Yeah, there's some related molecules to do that. Or how's the kidney function? All those data are there, but my goodness, they're piles of data. You have to look at it. You have to make sure you find the surprises when they happen. Um, lastly, I uh, just thank uh, my colleagues uh, here at NIH and, and my former colleagues at FDA for um, helping me learn a lot of this stuff, participate in clinical trials, and um, the yellow folks around the edges of this diagram reflect some of the sites of people who've uh, signed up and taken for this lecture. They also are representative of the people that I've collaborated with outside of the NIH at the F and the FDA. And I thank all of them for helping me um, pursue this interest.